So now it's with great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Michael Hund, who's the CEO of EB Research Partnership, an organization dedicated to funding research to treat and cure epidermolysis bullosa, EB, which is a life-threatening genetic skin disease. Um, I first met Michael, I think maybe five years ago, <laughs> about, and I was so inspired uh, by his leadership and the progress that EBPR was making in completely transforming the research landscape for this disease. So to give you a sense, since 2010, this organization has raised $50 million for research, funded 120 research projects, and accelerated the landscape from two to over 40 clinical trials. And they funded the, ver the first FDA-approved treatment for EB through their venture philanthropy model, a treatment that was just recently approved by FDA earlier this year, and that was also the very first topical gene therapy. Michael has an MBA from Yale and an undergraduate degree in philosophy from the University of Kansas. Um, I'm so excited he's here. Michael, welcome, welcome, welcome. I can't wait uh, to hear your talk. Thank you. This is Eli, this is Mikey, and this is Tilly. They are each curious, creative, and loving, and they are also some of the strongest people you will ever meet. Born with epidermolysis bullosa, or EB, their strength comes from a profound understanding of pain. EB is a life-limiting genetic disease that causes the skin to malfunction. Thankfully, EB is rare, but this is no consolation to the poor kids born with it and their continued agony as their skin blisters and breaks all over their body. EBRP is confident that eradicating EB is within reach. So how can we make sure that this happens? We share, we collaborate, we cure. EBRP has launched the largest EB data project ever, sharing clinical and genomic data from across the world to coordinate and maximize the efficiency of research into finding a cure. Curing EB is not an if, it's only a win. And at EB Research Partnership, our goal is to cure EB by the end of this decade. We have pinpointed the mutation that causes EB down to one gene one gene that allows our skin to heal. EBRP funds the most hopeful research projects and clinical trials in the US, the UK, Canada, and Australia. And using venture philanthropy, all returns on investment fund further research. A virtuous circle, if there ever was one. A singular mission to find a cure, not only changing the lives for EB sufferers, but it will serve as a gateway to eradicating over 7,000 other rare diseases. Now it's our job to accelerate the research from a bench in a lab to the bedside of a patient at breakthrough speed. Momentum is everything. We can cure this. Every Eli, Mikey, and Tilly out there deserves to grow up and to live. Deserves to fly. Help us heal, EB. Thank you, everybody. Um, look, I, I grew up in a 200-person town, cattle ranch in the Flint Hills of Kansas, so it's always very humbling to be on stages like this. So thank you, CZI, for having me. Thank you, CZI, for having us. I mean, last night was so inspiring. I was so fired up, and not just because of the open bar, but thank you for that too, CZI. <laughs> Tanya, everybody did get back to their room okay. But I was fired up because I talked to people like Luke, and I talked to people like Sunitha, and these are parents that are dedicating their lives to save their children's lives. And everybody in this room is here because you are fearless and tenacious and relentless, and you don't take no for an answer, and you're doing things differently, and you're innovating, and you're disrupting. And to be around people that share that passion and enthusiasm is one of the greatest gifts in life, the ideas, the inspiration, the hope, the learning. So thank you, CZI, for bringing us all together to create that sort of environment. It, it made me think about, um, does anybody know the difference between 
a buffalo and a cow and a rainstorm. What a, what a Kansas guy thing to say. I realize that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is something that I talk to. I have, I have four daughters, and I talk to my daughters about this. And sometimes we'll be out in public, and you'll learn in a second, and they'll say, Dad, I'm a buffalo. And people look at me like I'm crazy, right? Like, what are you telling your kids that they're buffalo? But I'm going to tell you the difference. In the Flint Hills of Kansas, where I'm from, you've got buffalo and you've got cattle. And when a rainstorm comes, they both behave completely differently. So what a cow does in a rainstorm, they see that thing coming. It looks scary. looks challenging, right? looks dangerous. And so what do they do? They do what they've always done and what cows always do. And they, they slowly start going in the other direction. They walk away from it, right? They run away from it. They move away from it. That's what we've always done. So let's keep doing that, right? And so what happens? The rainstorm continues to follow them, continues to follow them, continues to follow them, and they never really escape it. They don't resolve it. They don't solve it. So what a buffalo do in a rainstorm? That thing's coming, and it's scary. There's lightning. There's storms. And they do the opposite. They run right to the dang thing. They say, I'm going to run right through it. And it's going to be muddy, and it's going to be messy, and it's going to be challenging, and I might get hurt. And there might be some tears, and there might be some, some, some obstacles. But you know what? I'm going to do it, and I'm going to run at that thing so I can quickly get to the other side of it. It's going to be messy for a second, or maybe more than that, but I'm going to be on the other side. And I think that's what everybody in this room has chosen to do, right? You all chose not to run away. You chose to run towards, right? You chose not to do things the way that everybody else has done it for so long. You may be a parent, you may be a researcher, you may be a founder, you may be an executive, but you said, I'm not going to do things the way that it's been done. I'm going to do things differently because I want to get on the other side of that. Whatever your solution may be, it may be a treatment, it may be a cure, it may be a discovery in the lab, but you want to get on the other side of that thing, right? We want solutions, but we want solutions with speed, we want solutions with scale, and we want solutions with sustainability, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. But before I do that, just to know the audience a little better, um, Tanya mentioned some of the statistics. Rare is one, really diverse group of people here, which is amazing. But just by a show of hands really quick, raise your hand if you know someone personally affected by a rare disease. This is the first time I think that I've been in a room where almost every single person does, right? And it's not a surprise. I mean, the numbers continue to change. We used to say 7,000 rare diseases. Now we say 10,000 rare diseases. Somebody told me 12,000 rare diseases the other day, right? But I think the takeaway is one in 10 people we know are impacted by a rare disease. But this is the market problem, right? 95% of rare diseases that impact 10% of the global population, more than 400 million people, more than cancer and HIV combined, yet 95% we still don't have approved treatments for. That, that's a problem worth solving. We talk about big challenges in the world, um, and, and it's exactly groups like CZI and the people in this room that are going to solve this problem, right? That's worthy of solving. Tanya mentioned this, but EB Research Partnership, we were very fortunate this year to cross into the 5%. In May of 2023, this year, we got our first ever FDA-approved treatment after a decade of work. So why, do, why does it matter, right? Why does this matter? So I'm going to talk about it momentarily, but this was one that we funded six years ago under a venture philanthropy model. We put our capital in. We funded this on an equity-based grant contingent upon getting in a phase one clinical trial. And you know, six years is not that long of a time in the grand scheme of medical research. So to get this approval, I'm going to tell you a couple things that I heard from parents. So I had a mom reach out. And well, first, let me tell you what this is. It's a gene therapy, and Tanya mentioned this, it's a topical gene therapy, right? So the first ever topical gene therapy, almost like a lotion that goes right on the skin and starts to heal wounds. And I had a mom say to me, you know, their son is 10 years old right now. Their son used to dream and write books about a magic potion, right? Mom, someday I want a magic potion that can cure my disease. And she wrote me a note, and she said, for the first time ever, that I went back and I pulled out his book that he wrote four years ago and I said, this came true, right? We have a magic potion that can treat your disease. I had another mom say to me, which I think sums it up perfectly, you know, our mission, this is a, a treatment, it's an impactful treatment, it's a potentially life-saving treatment, it's not a cure, so we're not gonna give up until we have that cure. But I had a mom say to me, what this means is now we will have more kids to cure. 
And I thought that summed it up perfectly. We'll have more kids to cure, which means this is, this is a milestone. This isn't the final destination. This is a step in the journey, but it's not the end of it, right? But it'll keep more kids alive. So when we get that cure, there'll be more people to benefit from it. So before I kind of go into how this happened, and what I'd like to do today is, um, you know, I think uh, it's easy to sit up here and talk about wins and successes like that, right? But the reality is, is wins and successes don't happen with a lot of failure and a lot of challenges and a lot of lessons learned. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about our model, the mistakes that we've made, what we've learned, and hopefully give a framework that whether you run a rare disease foundation or a cancer foundation or you know, maybe you're attacking poverty or hunger, that this is a framework that you can think about um, in your own worlds, in your own organizations, in your own lives. But first, I want to start with the true north, which is patience. This is my friend, Salim, and Salim lives with epidermolysis bullosa. Epidermolysis bullosa is an extremely rare, life-threatening skin disease, right? And there's about 500,000 people in the world, about 20,000 people in the United States. And what does this look like? on a daily basis for Salim. So Salim wakes up in the morning. Um, the morning is different than when he went to bed. Uh, it's the equivalent of living your life like a burn victim, open wounds all over his body that they have to spend hours every day bandaging, hours every day of bleach baths, hours every day of doctor's appointments. It's extremely painful. Things like walking, eating, sleeping, even reading a book become extremely painful, monumental, task, things that some of us take for granted, right, that, that may seem simple to others, become extremely painful. Children with EB are called butterfly children because their skin is as fragile as the wings of a butterfly. Just the slightest bump and the slightest touch, it can shear off. Now, it's an incredibly devastating, brutal disease. I've worked in pediatric disease for 20 years, and you can't say one's worse than the other, but but this is a particularly devastating one because it's painful every single second of every single minute of every single hour for the children that battle this. But there's one piece of good news, right? It's a monogenic disease that's caused by one genetic mutation in the collagen 7A gene, and we know that. We have it in our sights. We have our target, right? We have our direction that we need to go, right? We know how to fix it. We know how to solve it, right? And we just need to accelerate the path to achieve that outcome. So how has this organization started? I think not much differently than many of your organizations, right? It started by a group of parents that felt progress wasn't happening fast enough, and they wanted to save their children's lives, right? And there's many in this room that can identify with that. I want to save my child's life, and I'm going to take action. I'm going to be that buffalo, and I'm going to do something to change this, right? Because nobody else is doing anything. So if not, if not me, then who, right? I'm going to be the one that rises to this challenge. So a group of parents got together. They knew they wanted to fund research. They knew they wanted to do things differently. We were lucky to um, have Jill and Eddie Vetter, who are amazing human beings. Jill's best childhood friend um, had a son with epidermolysis bullosa. They knew they had a platform uh, to raise awareness. And so they said, look, we're all in. And it wasn't your typical you know, celebrity ambassadors they were co-founders, they're board members, they're active in this every day. So it was a really big blessing early on to have someone with a platform like that. So here, here's a quote from Eddie. From the resilience of the families and the commitment of scientists, together our ambitious goal is to cure EB in this decade. So what is outcome-based thinking, right? Outcome-based thinking. And I'm gonna challenge all of you to think about this in your organizations and your missions. What's outcome-based thinking? I want to accomplish X, great, that's your mission. I want, to, I want to do X. I'm going to challenge all of you to think, I want to do X by when. How are we going to know when it's done? How are we going to know it's accomplished? So what's outcome-based thinking? Outcome-based thinking is Kennedy saying, I want to go to the moon by the end of this decade, right? And I want to rally the people with the best skill sets, the best teams to be able to do that. Outcome-based thinking is Martin Luther King saying, I have a dream, and painting that picture so everybody could see that we'll know when we've accomplished that vision and success. Outcome-based thinking is Nikola's Tesla in 1909 pitching J.P. Morgan on this thing called uh, wireless technology, right? And getting funding for it, but not having that be actualized until about 80 years later. We believe in this organization that outcome-based thinking becomes outcome-based believing. Be so passionate, even realistic, 
but passionate about what you do, put a timestamp on it. And we went to our research community, we went to families, we went to the biotech companies, and we said, we want to cure this as quickly as possible. Is it 2040? Is it 2030? Is it 2025? But we want to get some agreement. And look, that's the moonshot. You shoot for the moon to land amongst the stars. We believe that we can do this. And we've been able to rally the medical community to believe that they can do this, the scientific community, and patients and families, right? And getting that belief to do it has a way of motivating people, right? We landed on that moon. Um, we're still working on Martin Luther King's dream. Wi-Fi happened, right? But you got to start. you got to put those things out there. So as an organization... To date, where are we on that goal? How much progress have we made? I mean, you guys know the statistics. Most rare disease organizations never cross a million dollars raised. Half of rare diseases don't even have medical research foundations, right? So by, by pursuing this approach and this model that we'll talk about in just a second, um, are we on track, right? So we've raised $50 million to fund 120 projects. We've seen I think the most important metric is a 20 time, times increase in clinical trials. You know, when we started two clinical trials, you know, and, and many can relate to this story, not a lot of hope, not a lot of promise, not a lot of researchers in the space, right? But you got to start somewhere and you got to motivate, right? You got to be a catalyst to get energy in the space. So two clinical trials, the clinical trials were almost as fatal as the disease itself, right? And so in a relatively short amount of time, we've seen this rapid transformation of the landscape. And when you look at that, now than 40 clinical trials, we as an organization have directly funded more than half of those clinical trials, right? So if you kind of put your vision out of where you want to go, sometimes we have to create the landscape, right? And not wait around for others to start the companies or others to start the biotech companies or for others to run the clinical trials. Um, we've seen a 450% increase in revenue. Um, we started eight companies. We're now at four-phase clinical trials. We got the first approval this year, and we've done it all under this model called venture philanthropy, right? And the way that we do venture philanthropy mainly falls in these two buckets, public equity, private equity. We've done some milestone payments. We've done some guaranteed ROI. But really, I think it's important to have skin in the game, to have equity in these companies, right? To be a stakeholder, because our stakeholder and our shareholders are patients, right? So that patients have a seat and a voice at that table becomes incredibly important. Um, right now, we're teaching a case study at Yale University about our business model. Um, there's been case studies taught at Harvard. Um, we just won an award from MIT last year. But I think the funniest thing about this slide, I always laugh. And I don't know if I take pride or, um, or if it's hilarious or if we're off the mark, but um, you know, I didn't think when we, we were on this journey a couple years ago that an organization would be in Rolling Stone in nature. I, think, I don't know what that says about the organization. It's maybe more interesting um, than anything else. You know, one, one of the things that's been a big catalyst for us, and I think one of the takeaway here is to think outside the box. The pandemic happened in 2020. It crushed a lot of organizations. A third of nonprofits went out of business. We fight, many of us, for patients, right? And patients and families never give up, right? They wake up every day with strength and courage and motivation and hope, and they have no choice, right? They got to get up and fight. And so the pandemic happened, and we said, look, um, you know, we can't have public events. We can't have fundraisers. We're still a pretty small nonprofit. So what are we going to do, right? We're going to fight. We're going to move forward. We're going to think outside the box. We're going to get creative. So I talked to Jill and Ed and said, look, we got we to do something here, right? Um, and so we decided, hey, look, everybody's at home. Um, actors aren't working, musicians aren't playing. Let's just ask a couple people to do some videos, right? So it started with one or two people. Over the course of three years, this accident, right, and Vention is born out of necessity, happened where um, it became the biggest fundraiser we've ever done, a digital event, almost no cost to do it, right? Six million dollars raised, and millions of people learned about our mission for the first time. And we got all these people to kind of stand with us and support what we do. Never would have happened if we didn't just say, look, we have to do something, we have to do something differently, let's try something new. It became the most successful fundraiser, yet it was something when we wrote our business plan, when we wrote our budget for 2020, was not even close to being something that we would have thought about, right? So what I wanna go into now is a model, right? A, a blueprint, maybe, for acceleration, for treatments, for hopefully eventually cures, and that model really kind of rests on three pillars. Data platforms, research platforms, and Beyond venture philanthropy, thinking about an impact portfolio, an investment portfolio. So I'm going to start with data. Uh, around the time when Tanya and I, I met, uh, as she mentioned, about five years ago, we saw a big market gap, 
And I think many of you can identify this. And, and what's the gap, right? Um, because EB is oftentimes recessive, parents first heard the words epidermolysis bullosa in the NICU, right, in a hospital. And they had no idea. And doctors used to say things like, don't Google it. It's either a flesh-eating bacteria or this thing called epidermolysis bullosa. We're going to have to get back to you. Um, misdiagnoses, time, energy, fear, right? Then they would, of course, they're going to Google it, right? And they would Google it and, and see a whole host of you know, scary outcomes. They go on social media and start to navigate. And is this family talking about the same version of this my kid has or a completely different version? There wasn't natural history studies. There wasn't shared data sets. There wasn't, I mean, sounds familiar, right? I think a lot of us can relate to the State of the Union. So we said, look, let's get the key players together. Let's get them in one room. So we got a group of patients, bioinformaticians, clinicians, researchers, companies. And I went back and I locked the doors and I said, nobody's leaving here, right, until we can agree on a one sentence problem, right, of how we can solve this with technology. So what we walked out of that room, we said, what if navigating your journey with a rare disease was easy as entering a destination into your GPS, but the right turns were the right treatments at the right time, right? And your final destination was a treatment, was an answer, was a solution, um, was ultimately a cure. And I think about, this is my friend Jacob and Jonathan. And this was a couple months ago in Australia. They're two Aussie guys. And Jacob's two years old with epidermolysis below, so Jonathan's 18 years old. And they're sitting at this event, and Jonathan walks up, and he sits next to Jacob, and he sits down, first of all, and puts his arm around him, right? And he says, you're going to be all right, man. Like, we, we got you. But there's a couple things I want you to know. This is the best doctor that's close to you. These are the best bandages that you use. This is a clinical trial that I've been on. These are the people that know where to get bandages so you don't have to pay for them out of pocket. These are the best ointments and creams that you have to use, right? And these are things Jacob, all at a great medical center, had never heard before, right? So how do we take that interaction of two patients at very different points in their journey, and how do we make that simple? Right? Like I can put in my phone right now what's the best pizza place close to me, and it's really easy to do. Right? We should make this easy in healthcare. Good UX in healthcare is not something you hear very often, and that's not OK. Right? Like we deserve better than that. The patient community deserves better than that. So in 2020, we started an initiative called Curator. And Curator is a real-time data platform driven by patients at the center. Patients are in the driver's seat. And we got together a team. We worked with. Stanford School of Medicine and the Stanford Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine, not too far from here. Um, and we brought in Amazon Web Services to do the technology component of this. And it's a good team because um, we can spin up the ideas, but I can't go build the technology, enter AWS. Um, we can spin up the ideas, but everything has to be HIPAA compliant, right? So we brought in Stanford, so they have the, the IRB, right? They brought in the CROs, right? They, they brought in the process of making sure that every decision that we make is compliant um, and up to their standards. So what are the goals? Empower patients, put them at the center. You know, we forget this, right? And I've been part of data initiatives before. We forget this, but patients should have the choice of where their data goes. They should know when it's shared, with who it's shared, and they should have complete autonomy over that decision-making progress. Increase speed, right? All this data all the way, all over the place, right? But if we can get it in one place and we can leverage machine learning, AI technology to do rapid scale analytics, it puts speed in the system, connecting people, right, at one dinner table. And most importantly, build, foster, grow community. So how does this actually work? We went searching, right, like an explorer. We said, what, what can we go find? So we looked for clinical data that existed, things like natural history studies. Um, and then we decided there was a big gap. Half of patients didn't even know their genomic mutation, and a fraction of them had actually had genomics done. So we said, we're going to make this really easy, right? We're going to send kits to your home, and we're going to pay for genomic analysis to be done. We work with a company called GeneDx, as easy as 23andMe. Goes to your home, swab your cheeks, send it back to Stanford. They'll do a one-on-one -on -one telehealth consultation to walk you through what your genomics mean. We're not just going to give you a report. We're going to have you talk to a human, right? Ecosystem data, things like EHR information, immunizations, your PT visit, your, your um, occupational therapy visit, you know, aggregating that on one platform, and then the phenotype to the genotype, right? Patient reported outcome, but making it simple and fun, 
right? We wanted to solve a problem. Like if you get a 23andMe report, you look at it, you see where your ancestry is from, you probably never log back in again, right? We wanted to make this engaging. Good UX, come back on the platform, learn more information, see the survey. So simple surveys is the barrier to entry to get in, but then prompting patients to come back, incentivizing patients to come back. Where is the shared? Number one, and again, this is something that we forget sometimes in healthcare, give it back to the patients in real time, in real time. Don't tell me I gotta wait six years until it's published. Unacceptable. Let the patients see it, and I've been told a lot. I said, you know, they can't handle some of this information. They can't handle it without context. It needs to be done in academic center. I, I, I'm sorry, that's not true. I think they can handle it. So give it back to them in real time. De-identified population level health data. Give it to consortiums of approved academic medical centers, right? They can learn from this in real time. The ones that are helping contribute to the data set, you get to learn from this data set. And industry and regulatory. Right? What's one of the biggest barriers to get a clinical trial approved for a rare disease? Clinical trial recruitment, right? Time, money, cost. Can we solve that? Can we draw economics from this platform? Can we solve a market problem for biotech and pharma? You know, they budget big amounts just to get a potential name of a potential patient for a clinical trial. Imagine this world where the patients decide, do I want to share my data with a researcher? Do I want to share my data with a biotech company that's working in my disease area or my child's disease area. So imagine a world where you see a group of patients, an army of patients raising their hand say, I'm interested in clinical trials and mapping that with technology, right? That says your collagen 7A mutation and your child's eight years old, did you know there's five clinical trials currently happening in the US that they're available to? Click here, we just sent an alert to you, right? Disrupting the way that this happens. So quite simply, patient signs up, Brief registration, if they don't have genomic sequencing done, we mail it to their home. Stanford does one-on-one -on -one telehealth with them. They fill a really brief survey out. And based on those simple inputs, right, phenotype and genotype, simple, 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 make it easy on the patient, they decide where they want to share it. And one of the things that's important, they can flip on and off, right? Today I want to share with academics. Next week I may not feel like I want to, right? Which doesn't happen today in traditional medical healthcare settings. So they have the ability to change their minds on when and how they want to share data. They're connected with community members. I call it, it's kind of like a dating app for patients, right? Did you know there's another patient with a child that's exactly like you that's interested in connecting in your area? Great, happens in real time. Resource library that's customized based on their genotype and phenotype, right? You know, NEB, here's six videos that we've posted from University of Minnesota because we know you have a child with dystrophic EB that might be helpful to you. Automatic alert. Uh, medical center, here's the top five clinicians that are within 50 miles of you that specializes in your child's unique diagnosis, right? And then that mapping to clinical trials. Good UX, as I said earlier, part of this is making sure it's friendly, it's usable, that patients can see it. And what's the point, right? Going back to Jacob and Jonathan, we can paint a different future for kids being born today with EB, right? We've got our first approved treatment. But how do we put more speed into this, more speed into this? Kids being born today, we have the opportunity to save their lives. We have the opportunity to relieve the pain. We have the opportunity to try to treat and heal this disease and connect them. You know, the things that I hear from, from parents are, you know, it took them years and years to find another family who understood what they were going through. It took them years and years to know I should do my bandage in exactly this way. It took them years and years to know, oh, really, I should be with this doctor that's on the other side of the state than this doctor right now, right? We can solve that. And most importantly, you expand it to the research community, right? We formed a consortium, and I was talking with somebody about this last night as part of this model, a research platform. Consortiums are great. They'll get you so far. Um, you've got to incentivize people playing nice in the sandbox, right? So this, this comes with grants and payment. It doesn't happen organically too often. But I went to the consortium with this idea for a technology platform first, and it didn't go too well. You know, it was you try to get anything done by committee, it didn't really work. So we went and built it with one, and now they're all knocking at my door, right? So when you think about your strategies, what's the best way to do it? Do you want everybody's approval, or do you need one or two people's approval, right, to accomplish something and have them come back? Does collaboration work? We started something called an IPSL consortium. We received an application from Stanford University, Colorado, and Columbia in New York for this um, curative approach. Gene editing of IPS cells that was gonna be delivered via spray on skin, which sounds like science fiction, but was actually something that we funded. 
this group is entering the clinic next year. Each one said if they would have gone this alone, and, and, and sorry, we funded them under the condition that they collaborated and shared data with one another, right? And they came back to us last year and they said, look, this would have taken us 15 years to get this from the bench to the bedside in a clinical trial, but because you incentivized us to collaborate, we shaved a decade off of the process and now this is getting into patients next year. So collaboration can work when done right. I think one of the things that we're learning as an organization that I've talked to some of you about is really looking at the research portfolio, not just as individual projects, right? This science sounds great, this science sounds great, this science sounds great. If we were to do it all over again, I think we really would look at this like a traditional VC investment portfolio, right? Where are there synergies? What did we learn from this gene therapy that we funded? Should we lever more into protein therapy? Should we get out of immunotherapies and messenger RNA? And using data and technology, right? We're at this advent. People use words like AI and ML, right? And they sound buzzy, but it's real, right? You can use this. We're using machine learning and analytics to go through all our research, to go all the milestone ports, and you tell us the synergies that you're finding. You tell us what we should know about the research that we're funding. Last piece of this, venture philanthropy. I'm gonna tell you right now, venture philanthropy for us was born out of a mistake, okay? One of the first projects that we funded, um, we do what most organizations do. You write a check and you hope for the best, right? And we wish you well, it's philanthropic donations, we hope some of this works. Well, a couple short years later, that project that we were funded, I, I won't name names, was sold to a very big biotech and pharma company for billions of dollars. And we're kind of sitting here saying, wait a minute, you know, we, we funded this, somebody's making billions of dollars, we're sitting here with patients, which it's one thing to kind of miss out on a revenue share, but then we have no control over what happens to that, right? And this particular project ended up sitting on a shelf for eight years, um, was deprioritized by this company, why patients suffered, right? That's not all right. We can't allow that to happen. So for us, that's how venture philanthropy was born. And why is venture philanthropy important? Let's quickly talk about the market. $47 trillion in US assets, right? Smaller impact investments, eight trillion. US philanthropy sits over the side with 400 million, right? How do you bring these things together? Why should we bring these things together? The goal to make markets work is to get to the far left of that, right? We want competitive returns. That, that's what incentivizes investment. That's what incentivizes markets. The goal of venture philanthropy is to, to really de-risk early stage investments, right? And get it to a point where there's commercial interest so we can move it along this line and get it to the point where we're generating returns for things like treatment uh, approvals. Does this look familiar? What do we do? Fund early stage medical research, right? We hope that that gets to an exit with a commercial partner that's gonna take it into clinical trials. That becomes a viable product, right? That we hope gets an FDA approval and is in the hands of patients. And then we hope to generate some return to do the whole thing over again. It's exactly the same of how venture capital works, right? Angel investor, new product and service, sell it to big company, cash out and do the whole thing over again. So I'm gonna give you the example of how Crystal Biotech worked, right? That first FDA approval. We raise philanthropic dollars. We look for the best project. Those projects can be academics. Those projects can be um, biotech startups and pharma startups. Those can be private companies. Those can be public companies. What we just asked for is the best science and the best ideas. So Crystal Biotech back in 2017 was one of the applications that we got. We reviewed it with our SAB. They said the science sounds good. We took it to our board. They said, great, the SAB likes it, we do too. Not uncommon for medical research organizations, but what happens next is, right? We, uh, I, I call us venture capitalists with a cause or benevolent investors. What's important to us is negotiating good deals because patients are our shareholders, right? But the difference between venture philanthropy and impact investing is what? Impact investing, you know, you still prioritize a return. Venture philanthropy, we have the ability to take some of those bigger moonshots, right? But we're still gonna negotiate a good deal. We don't want board seats, um, we don't want voting rights, but we want fair equity and a fair shake if things are commercialized that revenue comes back to the organization, right? So that's exactly what we did with Crystal Biotech. We made an equity-based grant to them in 2017, contingent upon them entering a phase one clinical trial. Our investment more than doubled in about a year. We cashed out our shares, and four years later, we have our first FDA-approved treatment, right? Which is a positive story. We helped get this into a commercial party's hands. We helped get them into a phase one clinical trial. 
I took your dollar and your donation, I turned it into two, and now we have an FDA treatment approval. What I can tell you as far as one of the lessons learned, you know, our policy was when we can sell shares, sell them, right? We have a cash need, we want to fund research. I have done the math, which I'm not going to uh, pain you today. If we would have held those shares, it would have been a much different outcome. Instead of 2x, it would have been about 15 or 16x. But, you know, look, it, it, you never know, right? It could be zero. And so you make your best decisions. But I have learned one of the things that we're evolving to now is deciding, should we hold this longer? Should we exit from some of this and keep other shares? Really thinking about it, which I challenge you as a traditional investment portfolio, right? So what's another case? Um, back in 2016, we invested 500,000 in a gene therapy. Um, a company approached us in the university and said, we're interested in spinning this out. We worked with them to structure a deal that was a combination of return on capital immediately, what we learned from Crystal, right? Um, but also we want shares in the company, okay? We wanna hold some of these shares in the company and have the future ability to exit whenever we see fit. We held them a little bit longer than Crystal, which is great and we exited at $3 million. So we did a 6X return on investment and helped get this from a university setting into the hands of a commercial party. This particular treatment is up for FDA approval next year. So we're hoping this will be our, our second one NED, right? <laughs> Two more quick examples of, of venture philanthropy. So we talk about deal making, right? What's important in a deal? What have we learned based on those early experiences? We, we want equity, right? We wanna have a seat at the table a fair seat at the table, so this is commercialized. We don't want you to say, we'll give you 2X or 3X and then you have to go away. That's not how venture capital works, right? We want equity in the company as it grows. Um, we also want the ability, if you are gonna sit on it, that we can step in, march in rights, right? If you're gonna sit in this for too long, we have the ability as an organization to come in, get this thing out of here, and get it into the hands of patients, right? And if you're going to spin this up, or if you're going to deprioritize it and drop it completely, we have the ability to buy it back and have it come to us, right? So this is what happened with Wings Therapeutics. We had put $5 million into a biotech company in the Netherlands called ProQR. Um, you know, they weren't a giant biotech company, and they knew this was our policy. They knew this was in our contracts, and they came back and they said, look, you know, all honesty, we have to focus on a couple other treatments. How about we spin this back out to you guys? We'll keep some equity you put together a management team and run forward with this company, right? So that was an example of because we put that in the contracts, we had the ability to come in, spin this out into a company that we formed as an organization, have the majority equity upside, but keep them as an equity partner, right? So they shared their early clinical trial data. They shared the information. They shared the knowledge because they had stake in this company as well, right? That's now entering a phase one clinical trial. Lastly, like what, what's the convergence of venture philanthropy and impact investing, okay? So we just started five companies uh, before the beginning of this year, right? And as a nonprofit, that's great. We put management teams in. We have other people run it. We take equity stakes. We don't want control. We want less than 20% of the company. We don't want board seats. We don't want voting rights. We just want to see it succeed. But then we started to say, look, we've got these company assets sitting on our balance sheet as a nonprofit. That's not very investable, right? Is that the best place for it to sit? And so we started having some conversations. Is there a new different model here, right? So we tried to take learnings from everything that we've learned up to this point and say, is there a way to raise more capital outside of philanthropy and really get these treatments to hum? So including Wings, we took two other of the other EB companies. We moved those assets off of our books into a for-profit holding company. And we actually worked with two other nonprofits that had assets that were somewhat similar, inflammation, skin diseases, and we started this new company, right? And we saw the opportunity to say, look, this is a new model. If you're talking and having conversations with somebody, what are you interested in? Are you interested for a high risk but high return investment? Right? Are you return seeking? Are you an impact investor? Great, then we have this vehicle over here. You can put money in and if it succeeds, you get the money back. Are you still interested in philanthropy? Great, we have the same vehicle. You can give a gift to the foundation. We'll fund it, increase our equity as this succeeds. And every dollar that we put in, goes into EB, but our equity in the company is in the entire company. So if any of those drug assets succeed, we hope it's the EB ones, but we're hedging, right? Even if it's not one of the EB ones, we generate a return on investment to go back into EB, right? And this is one of the last lessons I want to impart with venture philanthropy. One of the things we've also learned is don't forget you're writing the check, right? Sometimes we get in this place of nonprofit organizations, right? 
you deserve to be treated like any other investor, right? And when, it, when any investor invests in a technology, and it's the first of its kind technology, and say, hey, look, I only care about it in my disease. If it's used in other diseases, that, that's up to you guys, no. So one of the things we've started to do in all our contracts is outside of field clauses. So if this succeeds, right, in other diseases, we get a share of that equity as well. And again, that helps our community, right? We hope this works in ED, but if the technology is used and monetized and commercialized in another disease, then we can benefit from that too, right? Just a new, innovative, different way to think. And again, that was learned from mistakes, right? Where we saw some technology we invested in that was pivoted and spun out to other diseases and we didn't really have a role in that. So fight for your rights to party, but also fight for your rights for venture philanthropy. <laughs> Just realize it. So in conclusion, what's the model? Data platforms, research platforms, thinking innovatively about your impact. What do we wanna do? We wanna share, we wanna collaborate, we wanna cure. Right? And if we do that, what does that mean? Well, for us in EB, I can tell you, if we do this, if we continue this, if we concede, succeed at this, it's not about a business model. Right? This is about human beings and their lives. This is about children. If we can do this and we can keep getting treatments approved, if we can get that cure one day, that means people like Mikey, like Eli, like Tilly, take hours of bandaging and doctor's appointments, and they put that into time with their friends and vacation and adventures. Pain and suffering into joy and hope and fun, right? The stress and the fear that these parents go to, they're given back time to be parents, to be with their kids and then enjoy that time. So that's the stakes that all of us in this room are committed to, that we should never, ever, ever forget. On a stressful day, on a tough deal, at the end of the day, we fight because these families fight and these kids fight. And one of my favorite quotes is Muhammad Ali said, the rent we pay for our time on earth is the service we give to the communities around us. So as I look around, it's an honor to be with you all. I'm excited to spend a couple of days with you and you guys pay some damn high rent. So thank you very much. <laughs>